I'd like to welcome you to the October program. Uh, you'll notice that Sue is not up here tonight. She's traveling, and so I'm Bev Riggins, the president of the society, and probably won't do as good of a job as she does because she's always so perky and full of information, but I'll see what I can do here. Um, she wanted me to remind you that the November 25th meeting, which uh, is a Monday also, will be Don Samford from Eureka on Lady Be Good World War II Plane. Those World War II uh, programs are always very interesting and well attended. That will be here at the church. And then December 10th is our Christmas walk. We've got five houses secured. And probably about a month before that, about the 10th or so of November, you'll be seeing tickets on sale. Um, we always ask if there are any members here who have any business to bring before the meeting tonight. And if not, we'll just proceed right into our tonight's program. It is entitled, Brother, Can You Spare a Dime? Our speaker is a professor emeritus of history from Western Illinois University. And one of the questions he'll be considering this evening is, does the depression of 1929 teach us any lessons today? He is the author of five books and many articles most of which deal with aviation and labor history. Please join me in welcoming George Hopkins. Thank you, and my voice carries reasonably well, but uh, if you need me to use a microphone, I think there is one over here. Yeah, well, this I think is for the TV. Uh, this is my wife, Elaine, of my wife of 54 years if we make it to December 30th, that is. <laughs> and uh, she's going to be handling the... Uh, I just put this iconic image of Franklin D. Roosevelt up on here as a, a way to sort of start the conversation about the Great Depression of 1929. Generally speaking, that was the event which had more significance for American history and the way we developed than any event excepting only the Civil War. Now some historians have said that that's because it touched people directly in the same way that the Civil War did. Almost nobody escaped some kind of contact with the war, the Great Civil War. It is also said that almost nobody was unaffected by the Great Depression. And it, of course, molded our political and social environment for the best part of the 20th century. And the, the man in charge of it all is Franklin Delano Roosevelt. Many of you, how many of you ever uh, got to actually lay eyeballs on FDR? Anybody here have that? No one ever laid, you? Oh, that's a little extreme, yeah. If we, I can use it. All right, I'll, I'll use it. If, if it's necessary, I will. I'll just, is this, is this better for you? All right. Uh, I actually saw Franklin D. Roosevelt in, when he was inaugurated in 1941. I remember I was four years old. I have the vaguest childhood memories of seeing him because I was living in Washington, D.C. at the time. And all I remember was cold and crowds, that's all, just cold and crowds. And I remember I had to pee really bad. <laughs> so my mother told me to just go do it in the side of the street. And she, she and my aunt, who was, they were there together, said they pretended they didn't know who I was. And I, blessed relief, I do remember that. But I remember mostly just being cold. Well, okay, I, Elaine, I'll, I'll gesture to Elaine to change the uh, pictures. And what I do usually is I just use the pictures I show to talk about the Great Depression. So let's, let's I'm going to, here, hold this phone for me, and I'll back this up to another picture, which I put in just for this purpose. This is very low tech, but it works. Uh, the Great Depression, let me see if I need to back it up one more, I think. Yeah, 
The Great Depression grew out of the imbalances of American industrial production. The oldest uh, truism about the Great Depression is that we had plenty in the midst of want, plenty in the midst of poverty. And it, the great obsession was how could this be when we had productive farms and productive industries? And the answer is that we did not properly balance the society. Fortunately, we would make strides during the Great Depression to balance that fundamental economic equation that if you produce things, you have to be able to consume them. And when purchasing power gets unbalanced, then the society gets unbalanced. And so we had a time in the late 19th century when the immense productive capacity of the American system, the industrial production, the agricultural production, wasn't a matter of physical want, it was a matter of imbalance. And that's what just made people so shocked that this could happen, that you could have great production and great plenty and yet people simply couldn't consume it because they lacked purchasing power. Okay, you can advance the slide, yeah. Now, there was, in the late 19th century, there was, it's sometimes depicted as the good old days, the, eight, the, the gay 90s, 1890s, et cetera. Well, it wasn't gay for everybody. It wasn't gay for a lot of people. Miners, farmers, all struggled from the end of the Civil War up until the Great Depression. The, the golden days of American agriculture in terms of production were when all this land came into production in the decades after the Civil War. The land came into production because of the Homestead Act passed by the Congress during the Civil War to spread population. Now that Homestead Act was not free land, I hope you knew that. You had to live on it and you did make modest payments for it when you homesteaded. But the, uh, the problem was that the productive capacity began to outrun our ability to consume it. Forward. And there, all the infrastructure of society was there. We had a, a tremendous transportation network, the most advanced rail system in the world by the, by the 1880s. Uh, a little statistic about this, this. When the first American railroads were were built in the late 19, well, beginning in the 1840s, the rail system begins to come into something like it. it was there so that the Civil War was the first railroad war. That's how troops got mostly to, to battle, was on the railroads. And so that was crucial for understanding the Civil War. In, uh, in the very first phase of railroad building up to the Civil War, about 90% of all the rails that were laid in the United States were manufactured in England or Germany overseas. By the, end of, by the end of the 19th century, basically by around 1890, we were making more steel than all the rest of the world combined by that point. So there had been a rapid industrial expansion and transportation. We, it was the marvel of the world, the way American industrial capacity came in. However, we were derelict in one fundamental aspect, and that one fundamental aspect was wages. Wages were not keeping up. And so the ability of people to produce was one thing, to consume it was another. Henry Ford, famously building Model Ts by the millions, began to pay his workers $5 a day, an unheard of wage. You know what he said why he did that? He said I he wanted his workers to be able to afford the cars they built. Okay, well, forward. Uh, John D. Rockefeller became the richest man who ever lived during this period. I guess you're aware of that. This is a symptom of the unbalanced uh, incomes of the time. Rockefeller, uh, was not famous for his uh, charity, but he did later become famous for being charitable and giving through donation, but not until the Ludlow Massacre of a Colorado mine camp where the miners went on strike and hired thugs shot them down. And then at that point, Rockefeller, under many forms of investigation in Congress and the most hated man in America, as he was called, began to become a charitable contributor, unlike his contemporary, forward, 
Andrew Carnegie, who's famous for saying what? Anybody know what famous saying about poverty and wealth and the accumulation of great wealth? He famously said, the man who dies rich dies disgraced. He intended to give away, and he did succeed almost in giving away his entire fortune by the end of his life. But he was untypical. He was, of course, the, the great, the steel baron, the, 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 the motive force behind U.S. steel. It was Carnegie Steel which formed the core of U.S. steel. Forward. But there were underneath all this great advance uh, several things that were, well, something almost unbelievable to us today. Children, they couldn't be more than 8, 10, 12, working 12-hour 12 days in factories. And twice in this time, twice we tried to pass constitutional amendments banning child labor. Both times it failed. We finally got rid of child labor by a trick. The trick was requiring kids to go to school instead of to the mines. If they have to go to school, then they can't be out working full time. If they're not in school till the age of whatever, 14 or 12 or whatever, then they're delinquent and can be arrested and their parents, I guess, arrested with them. But really that was a trick to get kids out of the workforce so there would be more productive work for adults forward. And of course there was this constant backdrop of violence in the late 19th century. We like our history kind of sugar-coated really. We don't like to hear the underside of it, but the underside of it always was the threat of violence. I mean we have well a good acquaintance with violence. Our Civil War was the worst, the biggest war uh, of the 19th century if you don't count the Taiping Rebellion in China, which was bigger, but we didn't know much about that. Uh, the American Civil War was the largest single war fought from the end of the Napoleonic Wars until the outbreak of World War I, and it was a bloody affair. And so there were millions of veterans, literally, in both North and South, who were well acquainted with violence, and when things went badly, they were quick to resort to it. And so this is a, a newspaper illustration from the Haymarket riot, riot, as it was called. And it was a bombing that took place in Haymarket Square in Chicago in the 1880s. So there was always this backdrop of it forward. And of course, famous uh, labor agitators, many of them here in Illinois, in the Illinois coal mines, agitating for a more equitable distribution of the wealth they created forward. And the, the, the first uh, m part of my uh, historical uh, specialty is the history of aviation labor. I wrote a book on the organization of the Airline Pilots Association, AFL-CIO, which still represents to this day about 90 percent of all professional airline pilots. And uh, so if you look at this, they got their idea when they were just airmail pilots in the 1920s by studying what happened with the locomotive engineers. They were the easiest and quickest and most formidable union of the late 19th century because they were skilled, they couldn't be easily replaced, and so when they went on strike, which they did often, uh, frequently uh, there was violence associated with these strikes. The great railway like railroad strike of 1894, that's the Pullman strike there, forward. And of course there were politicians in this period who did their best to make a political connection between labor and government. That's Eugene V. Debs. Many times the, a presidential candidate, he was the original president of the, the American Railway Union, there's a picture of him in 1897, Debs ran for president in 1920 and got nearly two million votes. You know where he was when he got those two million votes in the election of 1921 by Warren G. Harding? He was in the Atlanta Federal Penitentiary <laughs> for a violation of the Espionage Act of 1917. That's the same act under which Edward Snowden, who recently leaked things to, to the world from his national security post, is being charged under the, rail, the Espionage Act of 1917. <clears throat> One of whose provisions was anybody who 
inhibits the war effort shall be guilty of uh, espionage. Well, he went on strike. He and his railway workers did go on strike during and shortly before and shortly after the war. There was a lot of labor trouble, and much of it connected with violence. Go forward. <clears throat> now, the more successful politician of this era is Theodore Roosevelt. Uh, many of you know him as the Rough Rider, the war hero of the Spanish-American War, but he also turns out to be uh, a, a different kind of politician in that as governor of New York and subsequently as president, he had a good deal of sympathy for the working men. And in this case, in the anthracite coal strike of the early 20th century, he had the first presidential uh, presidential uh, meeting in the White House between labor leaders and union leaders. He brought them to the White House and literally locked them in the uh, White House room until they came to an agreement to settle the great coal strike of 1904. Okay, forward. Well, in the early 20th century, something called the Progressive Movement, today very much demonized by conservatives as something bad. Well, was it? What, what did the progressives try to do? Well, one of the things they wanted to do was to revise the Sherman Antitrust Act of 1890. Now, the Sherman Antitrust Act uh, forbade combinations in restraint of trade. It turns out it was originally its purpose now was to uh, stop monopolies, ensure competition in the market. But conservative judges generally in the 19th century applied it mostly to labor unions. They were a combination and restraint of trade, you see. And so in the 1914, or 19, actually 1913, the, the Sherman Antitrust Act was revised and it was called the Clayton Act of 1913 and its purpose was to exempt labor unions from the antitrust laws. So there's this long struggle of labor to get a living wage, a livable wage, and to this day this struggle goes on. What, is, what would be a livable wage today? It would be close to 24 bucks an hour if you took the original and first wages and hours law, which were passed in the New Deal, and the wage was the 4040 bill, it was called. 4040, what was that about? 40 cents an hour and a 40 hour week at a time when people mostly worked closer to a 60 hour week. Okay, uh, now the, the progressives tried to ameliorate a situation which had changed already in Europe. Otto von Bismarck was the first European leader, and this was in the 1880s to begin to institute a system of state minimums, state minimums and maximums, hours and wage, wages all mixed in, old age pensions, and, and all this was to create peace in the society, balance and a kind of peace. The progressives were trying to do the same thing. All three of these presidents, uh, William Howard Taft on the right there, who's famous for what? being the fattest guy ever to occupy the White House. He weighed 350 pounds. You can see he did well. Uh, Alex, uh, William Howard Taft, Theodore Roosevelt was succeeded by William Howard Taft, and William Howard Taft was succeeded by Woodrow Wilson in 1912. All of these are the progressive presidents of that period. A good deal of sympathy for what might be called ordinary Americans proposing Wilson famously and Roosevelt too, Theodore Roosevelt, that the power of government ought to be used to ensure balance and fairness in society. Forward. <clears throat> and Franklin D. Roosevelt is the inheritor of that tradition. And he came to power at a time when it seemed as if after two presidents had preceded him, Warren G. Harding, and Calvin Coolidge, and then elected in 1928, Herbert Hoover, uh, that it seems as if the old ideas had to change because of this catastrophe called the Great Depression. For <clears throat> the Great Depression was uh, so bad, partly because in 1920 the census revealed, you know, the census is required in the Constitution, 
we must count noses every decade. Uh, the 1920 census revealed that most of us, us Americans, lived in cities. And by the way, a city was defined in 1920 cens census as a, a town of more than 2,500 people. So by the 1920 election, we were a majority urban nation. It's only increased ever since. It's only, it just gets bigger and bigger. Today, one of the most heavily urbanized states in the, in the Union is Texas. About 80% of Texans live in four cities, Houston, Dallas-Fort Worth, San Antonio, and now over a million, Austin, where, Austin, Texas, which is where I earned my doctorate in history after serving five years and three months and 14 days in the Navy, but who was counting? It was so much fun. <laughs> I got her then, I got her at the end of that. Hard to resist a, a guy with a full head of hair and a, and a, a full-time job, which I had. For, okay. Well, okay, so you can see that in a, a society, in a society that's no longer entirely rural, it, it looks like you know, it's, it's gonna have a lot more impact. And so an urban population is gonna suffer more in a, one of the cyclical collapses that our American economy has always been noted for. Forward. You can't be home growing your own food. Now what Franklin D. Roosevelt did in the New Deal was to apply some of the lessons that had been tried out up to about up to 1921. Then in 1921 there was a reversal of course under the conservative trio of Harding, Coolidge, and Hoover and the result was a disaster. The Great Crash of 1929 and then an almost, what seemed to be an almost endless slump with no cure in sight. Uh, <clears throat> I was born in 1937, so if you do the quick math, I'm almost 77 now. I do remember my mother crying one time over a politician, one time only, and that was in 1945 when I came home, I guess I was in the third grade then, found my mother weeping in the kitchen and Franklin D. Roosevelt had died that day in 1945. Very strange, but I still remember that image of her dying. I think it's, uh, he made, he tended to make a personal connection with people, partly because of his personality, but also because of the programs he put into practice. You know, there, we were a lot of criticism of bureaucracy and government, but the New Deal was famous for all these federal programs which the critics of Roosevelt said was taking America down the road to socialism. And of course, then Harry Hopkins, no relation to me, by the way, uh, who was Roosevelt's uh, director of a number of these programs, uh, said, uh, well, yes, maybe in the long run, this, this will lead to socialism, but people don't eat in the long run, they eat every day. And so this program of the New Deal was enormously popular politically. Not all these programs work, but that's okay. Roosevelt said, we will try, the American people demand bold, persistent experimentation, he said. We will try something. If it doesn't work, we'll try something else. But we will try something to try to break the back of this depression and restore prosperity. Forward. <clears throat> now what did break the depression? World War II. Now why didn't Roosevelt spend more money? Well, because basically at heart, he was who he was. He was an aristocrat from a wealthy New York family. These were not poor people, the Roosevelt's, you know. Have you ever seen Roosevelt's, uh, how many people have ever visited Hyde Park, Roosevelt's home? Not a poor boy's house, is it? <laughs> so. Well, uh, he still, though, did not like the idea of government spending. In fact, he becomes the patron saint of the labor movement, although, in fact, he was not particularly fond of labor unions. He had this cultural aversion to them, but they were a useful instrument because labor unions raise wages. And it, basically, they knew that the problem was there was this imbalance in purchasing power. The rich took too big a share, and the poor got too little a share. 
And so the economy suffered when that was true. World War II saw the big problem of the Great Depression was massive unemployment. Same thing, it's this great recession we're in now, it's jobs that are the issue. Why aren't they coming around quicker? Well, one reason is we've cut back on so much spending and the spending that cut loose in World War II ended the depression overnight. Literally in a matter of weeks, there was a shortage of labor as America went to war. This is a, an aircraft production scene. The largest single appropriation in American history at that point was the so-called 100,000 air, airplane bills of 1939. And that came into practice in 1940 in which we began to be the arsenal of democracy. We're gonna hold everybody else's coat while they fight Hitler. And we would have probably still been holding everybody else's coat if Japanese hadn't bombed us into World War II at Pearl Harbor. But anyway, it was amazing how quickly when massive deficit government spending cured the Great Depression, something Roosevelt never favored, never fully applied. He went about halfway, and that's why we only got about halfway over the Depression, about halfway. We brought back to the 1929 levels, we got back about halfway, but we couldn't get beyond that until the war clouds threatened, and that broke loose a massive spurt of federal deficit financing and spending and the result was good. It led to the most massive economic period of well-being in our history, the period from the end of World War II up until famously about the 19, late 70s, early 80s. And since then, we've been in imbalance ever since. Okay, forward. One more. Uh-oh, not foolproof after. Oh, no, you oh, got to keep going. I had a space there. Yeah. Like. yeah. Okay, now one more. Uh, you know, we could have, that's the picture's out of focus, but you know who those famous people are. I didn't realize it was so out of focus when I made it, but uh, Hitler and Mussolini. We could have gone that direction with the Depression. Lots of people did. It happened in Japan. I'm a, a one of my specialties is Asian history. I got interested in Asian history when I was stationed in Japan from 1961 to 1964. And that's where Elaine and I acquired a little Japanese daughter. She's blue-eyed and blonde, but she was born in Japan. And she's, we made her there. Can so. she be president? I'm not sure she, well, I, John McCain was born in the Canal Zone, so I'm assuming that if he could run for president, our daughter, who's now 52, could run for president. But anyway. Uh, what we, the Japanese military took over in Japan in the 1930s for the same reasons that Mussolini and Hitler took over in Europe, or tried to, because they played on the economic insecurities and fears of ordinary people. Mussolini was said to have made the trains run on time. And Hitler, despite all that he did bad, some people like to say, at least cured the depression. By starting World War II, yes, well. Okay. okay, forward. Uh, well, now I'm going to just start discussing briefly on some of the major aspects of this period. Actually, Herbert Hoover was a good and decent fellow, sort of the American ideal, an orphan boy who put himself through college and became a fabulously successful businessman. I suppose some of you may have stopped and seen the Herbert Hoover Presidential Library and Museum in West Branch, Iowa. It's about on Interstate 70 as you go across, or is it 80? I forget one, it's Interstate 80, isn't it? Yeah. I, well, he becomes associated, despite winning a huge landslide victory in 1928, as the boy wonder, he, he becomes the iconic symbol of the American failure by 1932. He's blamed for every aspect of the Depression. It's not fair. No one says it's fair, but then life isn't fair either, is it? It happened on his watch. He did more to, to, than any other president has ever done to try to cure the Depression. Unfortunately, he remained absolutely orthodox on one thing, and that was what people needed most, and that was work relief. He would not spend money on work relief. And that's what Roosevelt did when he came in. He stopped a number of emergency employment programs 
much criticized later, but the idea was simply to provide works that would get some money into the hands of ordinary people. And uh, it was not a permanent program. That temporary emergency uh, work relief program of 1933 only lasted about a year. Yeah, about a year. There were other programs associated with that with public works, but they were harder to do because it took longer to get that kind of employment up. It took some skilled labor and it took a lot of appropriations to build Boulder Dam, what later becomes, you know, it was actually passed by Congress in the 20s to build it, but it started to work in 1930 under Hoover, and he did it partly because he wanted to generate employment out in that part of the country. His name becomes associated with every aspect of, of the Depression. If you didn't have a job and you lived in a shanty town, it was a Hooverville, of course, for it. And in 1932, Roosevelt didn't really need to campaign. It was a landslide from the get-go. The only question was, how big would his margin be? Because Hoover was poisonous by that point, since he was personally blamed, unfairly, I grant you, for every artifact of the Depression. Forward. Uh, and there they are looking, Roosevelt looking typically sort of happy and Hoover looking rather sour as he, but he had literally had worked himself almost half to death during that. He worked more hours, took no vacations, but it seems like everything he tried didn't work very well. Although it is said he started the New Deal, he just didn't go far enough with it. He, he did try to do some things, but he remained orthodox on the question of direct federal aid to the states to provide employment. And that's what Roosevelt settled on. We, he'd make appropriations to the states who would then generate employment on what kind of projects. Most famously, roads and, and infrastructure, we'd call it today. A lot of the inf uh, we live in a neighborhood in Peoria that's just had its sewers and water pipes replaced last summer. Those pipes had been in for 70 years. So some of those were put in during the New Deal. And, uh, and they, finally we got around to it. It made a big mess in our neighborhood, but we lived with it. Uh, <clears throat> so, forward one more. Uh, Roosevelt has the, the ability to be uh, all things to all people, uh, apropos of my mother weeping when Roosevelt died, something I'd never seen her do before. There was a famous story that during Roosevelt's funeral procession in Washington, D.C. in 1945, there was a man weeping unconsolably, and a reporter walked up and says, did you actually know Mr. Roosevelt? He said, no, I didn't know him, but he knew me. So it's amazing that a politician can make that kind of personal connection but he was the absolute master of American politics to the end of his life. He's the only president ever elected four times. They had to change the Constitution to make sure no other Roosevelt would ever come along. And so, but they did. And so there we have it. Okay, forward. Uh, by the way, uh, the bonus, the, the, the in World War I, typically, uh, the uh, soldiers who served in World War I were guaranteed a bonus for their service because they lost productive years of work during the period 1917 through 1918. Congress passed a bonus bill in the early 1920s. It was going to pay off a certain amount of money, I forgot now what the exact total was, to anybody who served in the Army during World War I, but it wasn't payable until 1945. Yeah, well, that's the way those things work, a lot of lag time. Well, okay, at the beginning of the Depression, then in 1932, the, the veterans, many of them unemployed, said, why don't we get our bonus now? So these were the bonus marchers who marched on Washington in 1932 in the last days of the Hoover administration. Forward. And, of course, they were met by violence and force, and it was a, a terrible political move for for Herbert Hoover to have those marchers disperse. He was unhappy that there was so much violence, but when you turn the army loose on, on ex-soldiers who know how to fight, you can expect a bad, a bad outcome, and there was a bad outcome. But it was politically very damaging to Hoover and beneficial to Roosevelt. It also wrecked the 
the presidential ambitions in the future of the army officer who commanded the units that, that burned out the uh, bonus marchers. Does anybody know who commanded those troops that attacked the bonus camps? Uh, it was Douglas MacArthur. He wanted to be president. He tried to move on it several times, but he, he really didn't get much in the way of, of veterans' votes or anybody else's. Forward. And, of course, the New Deal, it's, I was going to give you a little discourse on its various acts. Uh, Labor's Magna Carta, the Wagner Act. We, we've forgotten. What was the, the Wagner Act? It was the 4040 Bill. Norris LaGuardia Act was another. There were a whole series of labor-related bills, and still there was violence. This is the Republic Steel Strike of 1936 and 35 in uh, Chicago. And it was to get the entire industry unionized, the United Steel Workers, and there was violence. I think 16 strikers were killed by Chicago police that day. Okay, so forward. Uh, but when you have massive numbers of unemployed men, many of them veterans of the military, it's a very dangerous situation. And so when that bonus march took place, it really panicked what we would today call the establishment. Do you know how Mussolini came to power in Italy in 1923? Through a march of unemployed veterans marching on Rome and they seized power. That's what, that was what was there. What we got with Roosevelt, instead of that kind of military takeover and the resort to violence, even though there were an awful lot of people during the Great Depression who thought we needed a dictator, and some of the people who were thinking that were not altogether what we would call left-wingers. They were conservative establishment figures who were advocating a man on horseback or a, a strongman government. We didn't get that. We got instead a relatively mild reform movement which, didn't, which left American capitalism pretty much intact and we avoided uh, Hitlerism or Japanese military dictatorship in the 1930s and we also avoided Mussolini's uh, form of a grandiose dictatorship. Said so we, we basically got ourselves into a system where we began to put certain institutional programs together that ended the possibility of another side of kind of massive collapse like we saw in 1929. Unfortunately, th that form of uh, idea has kind of gone away. We changed the Glass-Steagall Act, which was written particularly to keep us from having another Wall Street crash. We changed that, and we got another Wall Street crash in, in 2008. And the same thing is true about the, the fate of a lot of other programs that were associated with the New Deal. Not one single one of those has ever been, a, been a, gotten rid of. I mean, today, the idea of getting rid of Social Security is something no politician wants to admit he's in favor of, even if he is in favor of. And the same thing is true of minimum wages, maximum hours laws, and so forth. So we, this is the kind of reform movement, overdue reform movement, the New Deal put into to power. Uh, <clears throat> forward. Well, I was already made, already made that point, didn't I? <laughs> okay. Okay, forward. Uh, I was going to next talk about Roosevelt's background, but I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to defer on that. What time is it, and we, how long have we been going here? We don't want to run over. Why don't we stop? Five more minutes? Or? Well, okay, I'll go a few more minutes. It's 20 till. It's 20 till. We should be uh, through at uh, 8 o'clock then. Okay, five more, minutes. five more minutes. Well, all right, what I'll do now is I'll just show some pictures. If you see anything that you note, you would prompt you to, to uh, ask a question or make a comment, this is, will be the time. Forward, privileged youth. You know, he was a product of what was called a May-December marriage. His mother was much younger than his father. In fact, he's got siblings that are by his father's first wife. And so it gets very confusing, uh, but uh, he died, his father, he, when his father died, fairly elderly, it, that, he was still a teenager, basically. 
and he was an only child and quite a mom of Hyde Park, New York. And if you've never been there, it's a National Historic Site. You can, and there's also a library there, which I was done some work in as a historian. Forward. Uh, he, he wanted to emulate his, his famous fifth cousin. Teddy Roosevelt was his fifth cousin. And that means I think they had the same grandparents, right? Is that right? That's third. Great grandparents then, or whatever. You know what class of people they were? They were uh, the, from the old Dutch aristocracy when New York was New, Am New Holland, New Amsterdam. They were rentier class. They owned the mass massive amounts of estates on, in upstate New York, and they lived on rents from land, pretty much. And in fact, Roosevelt said the key to his political success as a, a speaker on radio is famous fireside chats where he explained his programs to the American people in a most intimate way. He had a wonderful radio voice with a strange kind of upper class, almost English accent. But he said whenever <laughs> he made a speech on radio, he imagined himself sitting across the desk from the microphone with one of his tenant farmers that he knew very well. He pretended to be talking to him. And he made this kind of intimate connection. All they only made about 30, I think 31 fireside chats on the radio. But they became famous for the kind of thing that Roosevelt was famous for, which was to build this almost personal sense of connection. Now, of course, he was also called a traitor to his class. A traitor to his, he was of the rich and the upper class and he, he went against them by trying to spread the wealth, it was said. Uh, there's a famous cartoon that appeared in the Saturday Review of Literature in this period. It shows a little boy writing a dirty word on a wall and his mother is scolding him and the word was Roosevelt. <laughs> so, so, but uh, I think it's a, generally agreed that today there were alternatives to American capitalism on the left, which Roosevelt, by occupying a kind of a middle ground, by instituting something like the progressive idea of a balanced society with the government being the employer of last resort. In fact, at the end of World War II, almost unknown to most everybody, Congress, so fearful that once 15 million people got out of their uniforms and came home, there wouldn't be jobs and there would be big trouble and the depression would just resume. It did not, but there was that great fear. And so Congress, out of that fear, passed something called the Full Employment Act of 1946, which is still on the books today. What does it say? It says the government shall be the employer of last resort, knowing that revolutions and violence are directly associated with massive unemployment and the kind of social unrest and violence that that sort of thing brings. Could we learn something from that today? I don't know. I don't know. Every time I go around Peoria after living there for all these years, I see an awful lot of unemployed, disengaged people. I don't think it's just because they're lazy. I mean, I don't think that at all. I don't think people are naturally lazy. I think they're not. I think people want to do things. But you have to, the society has to make the opportunity for them to do those things. Roosevelt did. Perhaps the most famous example of that was something called the CCC, Civil Civilian Conservation Corps. By the way, there was one natural disaster during the Depression. It was the Dust Bowl. It was basically overusing the soil and lack of husbandry of the soil. And it, we got these dust storms which just wrecked everything. And so one of the things the CCC did was it took unemployed young men, put them under army supervision. The military actually ran these CCC camps, which accustomed a whole generation of young men to military service, which would come in handier after, night, after Pearl Harbor, after we instituted a, a massive military buildup. But the CCC in this period reforested major parts of the American West, reforested. Up, up until fairly recently, a majority of buildings in the national park system, roads, buildings, structures, were built by the CCC. A majority. Now it's, they've had some appropriations and they've revised some of these and they've done some more building. 
But this was the kind of infrastructural work was, was being neglected in which the Roosevelt's advocated. The, grand, the granddaddy of the national park system, of course, is Theodore. You do know that, don't you? He was the creator of the first national park, Theodore Roosevelt. And, okay, forward. Uh, we had our own ver version of homegrown uh, would-be dictators. Uh, does anybody know who this is? Huey P. Long of Louisiana. And what, why didn't he get to be president? Well, he got assassinated in 1935. That's why he was going to challenge Roosevelt and might have beaten him from the left. I guess you could call it the left because he was a wild-eyed radical populist. Believed in sharing our wealth. That was, the other, that was what was out there besides Roosevelt, further, much further to the left than Roosevelt. Huey P. Long thought that every American had a right to a job and a car and a radio so they could listen to him talk on the radio, I guess. And, and it, basically it was just a flat out distribution. He would have capped incomes, redistributed, strict redistribution of wealth. You know what he used as his justification for the redistribution of wealth? The concept in the Old Testament of Jubilee, the year of Jubilee, this is a church, well, I don't know about that. It was, it, was, it was a tradition in Jewish culture that every so often there would be a year of Jubilee and that would be all debts forgiven, right? All debts canceled and all property and wealth redistributed. And then it would start over again and the rich would get rich again. Eventually they'd have to have another year of Jubilee because the rich are always going to do. The rich get rich, the poor get children. Yes? Okay. Forward. Uh, well, there's, I was going to go into, that's uh, Missy Lehand, his other wife. Uh, you can see the shrunken, shriveled legs. Left to his own devices, Roosevelt would have been a member of the idle rich, it is often said. But he married well. Some of us are lucky that way. And he married a woman who was more of a social worker, do-gooder type, Eleanor Roosevelt. He, he seemed to understand he needed that kind of alternative because like I say left to his own device he would see would have been a member of the idle rich he was a very good golfer by the way but he was stricken by polio and it, it is said that polio made him the kind of sympathetic listener uh, that that could understand and relate to the American people in the era of his stress he had overcome polio it was thought he never really did but he put on a pretty good act of a big braces on his legs and so forth and uh, so that's the man with whom we still will associate the Great Depression. Right now, I don't know who's going to come along and do that, but forward. Let's see what else I've got up here to talk about. Oh, bread lines, Chicago, bad scene, unemployed men, mostly you'll notice. Forward. Uh, weather, the Dust Bowl, forward. Go. And, of course, massive movements of people. Uh, it, the artists probably give us a better description of what that was like. Uh, John Steinbeck's Grapes of Wrath give an idea of how what dislocations were associated with this massive movement from the rural to the urban life, or in this case, symbolically, California. Okay, forward. <clears throat> uh, Roosevelt could, could stand, but only holding on to one of his grown sons. Uh, and he could walk a few steps, but there were no pictures of him in a wheelchair, virtually none. There's one or two. Uh, an issue came up when the Roosevelt Memorial was being built. The, the, the handicapped activists wanted him to be depicted in a wheelchair, but of course he never was, one or two times ever was he ever photographed in a wheelchair. He wanted to give this image of robust good health, although it, he certainly wasn't, wasn't helped by the fact that he was a heavy smoker, but go. That's one of his emblems of his uh, idle rich again, forward. Uh, there's Eleanor, uh, was not a marriage made in heaven. You surely know that by now, don't you? You've heard of Lucy Rutherford? Mm, okay, well, our, there are no secrets. There are no secrets. He fell in love with another woman during World War I, his wife's social secretary. And she was with him. I mean, this was not a fly-by-night love affair. She was with him on the day he died in 1945. Eleanor found out 
that was furious because she only stayed with him because he promised in 1918, he promised he would never see her again. And, but he did. Oh well. Cupid's arrow and all that. Forward. Uh, happy life. Well, not really. Forward. Uh, image of health. He associated with Warm Springs, Georgia, you know, because he th thought healing waters would cure the polio. Nothing cured it except vaccines. Okay, go ahead. And that was one of the last pictures you see of him walking. Because of his famous name, he was the vice presidential candidate with a man named Cox who ran against Warren G. Harding in 1920. Many people thought he was Teddy Roosevelt's son. They didn't care. Just the name Roosevelt because of Teddy was so magic. And Teddy had just died in 1919. And so it, it was a good time to plug him in. Forward. They lost overwhelmingly. And, uh, you know, one of the things we're not talking about in this is race. The Republican Party had always been the party of the black voter and the Democratic Party the party of racism. That shifted in the Depression. Why? Not because the New Deal was particularly friendly to race relations. It was not. But because, because blacks were poor, they benefited from the New Deal. And so that's caused, that started the swing of a whole sw political internal swing to the, of black voters to the Democratic Party. 1926, that was a parade in, I think it was in Washington, D.C., of the Ku Klux Klan, a very powerful institution. And not just the South, really the Midwest, too, forward. Uh, that's the Roosevelt in 1928, uh, giving the nominating speech for uh, Al Smith, uh, who was the first Catholic Democrat, or Catholic to be nominated. There's only been one Catholic president, and we killed him, right? Kennedy, okay, forward. Uh, that was the quintessential Roosevelt, the young aristocrat, working on Wall Street in the 1920s. He also worked, he went to law school. Did you know that? Yeah, he, he was a lawyer, although he never passed the bar exam. Didn't need to. He wasn't really working. He was sort of playing in it by, go ahead. But he became, because he got polio, it was said he was the kind of guy who could listen and, and empathize with people, could understand ordinary people's problems forward. And he was absolutely the master of American politics until the end of his days. And uh, to this day, uh, we still remember him, I think. Those of us who had some personal memory, like their mother weeping in the kitchen of what kind of appeal he had. I can't imagine my mother weeping over any other politician of either party. She was born in 1905 and she's long gone, but she, was, she admired Roosevelt. Like a lot of poor rural people, and we were that, did. Stop the light. Should I stop now? Yeah. I could talk all Ask night. I'm a professor. We never are short for words. <laughs> I have, yes, anybody want to make a comment or a question about it? Sure, go ahead. Uh, why did he choose Truman as a running mate? I'm sorry, no? Why did he choose Harry Truman as a running mate? Because he wasn't Henry Wallace. See, Wallace was his vice president from 1940 to 44. And Henry Wallace was a honest-to-God progressive leftist. You know, he, and he was too liberal the New Deal's fundamental and fatal flaw was with its compromise with the South. And here's what that amounted to. The Southerners were poor, and they liked New Deal's social and economic, economic problems, but they did not want the racial system of the South challenged, and Roosevelt never did. He let that system alone. That's why, despite what the Constitution says, we did nothing about enforcing its racial provisions drafted after the Civil War until the 1960s until a century after those things were written into the Constitution about voting and all that. And so Henry Wallace was on the left tradition in American politics, and he'd been four years, and so the Southerners in a party wanted to get rid of Wallace, and they could do it by getting rid of him through getting Harry Truman, who was an almost unknown. And Roosevelt didn't even know him, but by this time Roosevelt was so sick that he was being pretty much just living out his last days there. 
So that, that's why Harry Truman was, was chosen. He was acceptable to the South and the North, and the Democratic Party was, had this division which was eventually gonna rupture with the passage of the Civil Rights Acts in, in the 1960s. As Lyndon Johnson said when he signed the Civil Rights Act of 1964, he said this is gonna turn the South Republican for a long time. Now it's the most Republican part of the country because that, those racial re resentments are very deep and they've always been there. It's the great race, it's the great stump in the field of uh, America. It's still there. It'll always be there. I don't know whether everybody who dislikes uh, Obama is a racist, but I know that everybody who's a racist dislikes Obama. So if you are a racist, you're not going to like Obama even if you're not a racist otherwise. That's a little distinction, but I think you get my drift. Yeah. That's a good one. I don't know the answer to that. I know that it also is what we, that's where we get our land grant, that same batch of legislation passed by Congress as soon as the South seceded, uh, Congress passed the, land, the college land grant bill Last thing uh, the racists uh, in the South, uh, the Civil War South wanted was that people were getting educated. Not one single su Southern state had free public education until after the Civil War. Are you aware of that? Yeah. Not one single Southern Confederate state had free public education. Not one. Yeah. Uh, safeguards we have now keep us from sliding into another great depression. Well, that's part of the, what the New Deal did. Uh, you know, uh, unemployment insurance, big one. Guaranteed home loan mortgage. In fact, if, if we had done after the 19, 2008 uh, crash, what Roosevelt did, which, which he created the HOLC, the Home, Own, home Owners Loan Corporation, instead of loaning the money to the banks, Roosevelt loaned it to the people whose mortgages were underwater, and they then could pay off their mortgages. What we did, the only thing we could get through Congress was to bail the banks out with the idea that they might then re, re, renegotiate the mortgages, which were part of the thing. And of course, that has been pretty largely a failure, that renegotiation of these home loans. But uh, yeah, there are things like that. Unemployment insurance, oh, you know, the greatest source of poverty historically has always been in any society everywhere, old age. That's when you can no longer work. Well, Social Security has almost eliminated poverty among the elderly. Almost eliminated it. But then there are all these other little, the big one is, is unemployment insurance. Uh, that's, that's to keep a minimum floor under, under uh, purchasing power. And then we hope that the market will turn around and we'll, uh, we'll get back on our feet again someday. But we're averse at this point because it's become so politicized the idea of what we did in World War II, which is massive public spending to generate employment and break the log jam. There are still politicians out there wanting to do it, but they can't get a majority of anything through Congress now. I mean, I don't know what they do with all these people who are unemployed. I'd say, yeah, the idea of having those guys out raking leaves now that the leaves are falling in my front yard? I'd like to have somebody get paid 35 cents an hour to rake leaves from one side of the street and then come back in the afternoon and different guys rake them back on my yard. It was about that simple. But then it was a much more extensive than that. There were all kinds of things that people were paid to do. Roosevelt was fairly simple about it. He said, look, artists are people. They get hungry. Sure. We'll hire them to paint murals in post offices. And they did. Massive make work. It wasn't massive enough, but it seemed massive enough so that Roosevelt was hugely reelected in 1936, you know, after four years of this. He carried every state in the Union except Maine and Vermont. As Maine goes, so goes the nation. No, as Maine goes, so goes Vermont in 1936. So that was it. And, and so what he did worked. And it's at that point, 1937, he starts trying to cut back. And that created what was called the Baby Depression of 1937. My parents got married in 1931. My dad was a high school graduate and was in a Sears employee, he was an assistant manager of the tire department or the automotive department at a Sears store. He lost his job in 1931, right after about the time he got married to my mother. 
and I'm an only child, and I remember they didn't immediately want to have children because it was just too tough. And so birth rates went down in the Depression, you know. It really did drop. And I was born in a real sort of a... But then things looked better in 1936, 1930. So I got born in 1937. And so that's the kind of way things went. And Roosevelt just never quite wanted to spend enough. World War II cured that. Yeah. Uh, my father was born and raised on the farm. Mm -hmm. The Works Progress Administration, it was called. Yeah. Anyway, um, he, one of the guys that was working on the WPA used to work for him on the farm. So he uh, convinced this guy to go to work for him. Uh -huh. Probably a little sure too. <laughs> yeah, the, there were any number of these programs to generate make work employment. Many of them did good things. Like I say, to some extent, uh, the national road system is, still follows those lines. You know, it's, let's face it, we all use roads, and uh, especially with the automobile culture developed after World War One. Anybody else got a comment about? The depression or anything you want to. Let's all give George a hand. Oh, thank you. Thank you.